Let's talk to the former Chief Constable of Greater Manchester Police, Sir Peter Fahey, who joins us right now. Good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, there's no doubt at all we are not in a situation like America where there seem to be an awful lot of trigger-happy police, where the cops just, you know, they're routinely armed, they get out their guns, it would appear, the first, you know, the first moment of any, any, any trouble. Um, we, we know that um, we have you know, a small percentage of our police who are armed through choice. They don't get any extra pay for it, although higher status. But um, 18,000 uh, situations uh, in England and Wales last year where roughly 18,000, that's pretty much similar every year, where firearms officers are called to the scene. Uh, 4,000 in London last year. And of those, 0.05%. Uh, I mean, a tiny, tiny fraction of a percentage uh, where a shot was actually fired. Um, do we have an issue with our firearms officers being, in your view, either trigger happy and needing to be investigated or an issue actually where they haven't got the protection when they do actually do the job we ask them and pay them to do? Well, the first thing is you're right to put this in context. We need to remember that we are very, very unusual in this country to have a routinely unarmed police force, uh, almost unique in the world. Uh, and you're also right, Julia, that we have a very, very small number of incidents where police officers fire a weapon. Uh, and it is an absolute tribute to their professionalism that they deal with the vast, vast majority of very dangerous incidents very professionally, um, uh, you know, and keep the public safe. But the fact is, you know, number one, there is a wider issue here about discontent within the police. You know, there is very low morale at the moment uh, in the Metropolitan Police. There are more officers, I believe, leaving then joining, there is no question that this is building into a wider issue of discontent, really, where police officers feel uh, unappreciated, um, they feel misunderstood, uh, and they feel that some of the very understandable high-profile cases have been used to denigrate the whole of the police force. So I think that is the wider context here. But this particular issue, you know, has been an issue for policing for the last 30 years in terms of people who die uh, as a result of police action and generally the police service has been very successful in reducing that number uh, particularly deaths in custody uh, particularly deaths when uh, they're pursuing suspected stolen vehicles um, and therefore I think that's the approach here I'm a bit worried about you know a review where it's done over the weekend yeah. uh, on the back of Twitter and tweets and stuff like that this is a long-term fundamental issue about how we deal with armed criminality uh, the officers, the, you know, the firearms officers need reassuring. The Met has got to try and take action to get some of those officers back, um, uh, taking up their weapons again. But there is a more fundamental issue about the way we deal with suspected armed criminality and particularly organised criminality, yeah. uh, which is in an old-fashioned way. Because basically, Julie, you want to try and reduce the number of situations where officers have to un in intervene and make split-second decisions uh, in very fast-moving... Yeah. And uh, that's you know, it. And when we sit in judgment, and this is the same, I think, with for the military as well, but when we sit in judgment in, you know, in our armchairs or in our studio chairs, um, we are not in, quite literally, the firing line. Uh, and, and we're often told, and again, I'm not talking about the specific case involved here, but we're often told, you know, uh, the, the suspect was unarmed, but often, you know, it's question is, does the police officer have a reasonable belief that that person is armed? Is, is a more relevant and pertinent mm. question at that moment. And again, you know, we're all very grateful when we said, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here just on top of the London Bridge in Talk TV Towers when we had the incident a few years ago where we had terrorists marauding around London Bridge area, slashing yeah. people with machetes. And those police officers, I mean, uh, there was an unarmed police officer off duty who, I mean, absolute hero, many public mem members of the public who were heroes. But when those armed officers got zoomed to the scene, got out, knowing these people, you know, and literally just went do 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 and took those people out. I think most of us will say, thank God for those officers. But mm. in that scenario, would you be willing to pick up that weapon and do that if you're going to face, you know, a multi years long investigation? You're up being suspended, question marks, people pointing the finger at you and your family. And that is the thing. We need to have scrutiny every death, every time, you know, a weapon is discharged. There needs to be proper scrutiny. But it needs to be done in a different way from the way we look at ordinary members of the public discharging a weapon, surely? Uh, I don't know. Um, you know, the police are subject to the criminal law exactly the same as everybody else, you know, and it applies to police officer firing the weapon as to anybody else firing or using a weapon. And I think it would be a very difficult road if we try to change that. OK. You know, because you're absolutely right, and you will have families on campaigning many, many years for justice. And I think that looks at, you know, we need to look at that as well. 
when these tragedies happen, how do we try and give justice to those families without necessarily it all being focused on the individual officer yeah. who had to, you know, use their weapon? Yeah, uh, and exactly. We see, campaign, we see campaigns by families and often these are treated with a lot of sympathy and empathy in the media, yeah. but we don't perhaps see the same campaigns because by officers who were told, you know, don't say a word, keep quiet, stay anonymous. And so you often don't hear both sides. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm of the view that a court of law is the right place for this to yeah. uh, you know, fall, you know, fall out, but then you often wonder whether these cases would come to law. It, again, I'm not talking about any specific case. If there weren't these these campaigns, um, can I can I ask you about the idea that you know a lot of, the number of these officers who've put down their firearms are in the counterterrorism unit, and the army basically being called to be on 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 alert, ready uh, to cover uh, to cover the shortage of officers? Um, should we be concerned by that? I don't think necessarily, you know, there have been occasions in the past where the police have asked for the support of the military. I think it's particularly would be around guarding duties and protection uh, of various people. So this happened in the past, you know, there are procedures for doing that, but clearly that isn't a satisfactory situation. You know, this needs to be resolved. Um, the commissioner needs to work with those officers, but at the same time, the Home Office needs to recognise this is a far wider issue yeah. about discontent in the police service uh, and rushing out a review isn't going to really deal with that. As okay. I say, there are more, much more fundamental issues because ultimately police officers want to get out there and police. Indeed. Uh, and there are lots of ways at the moment that they are, you know, prevented uh, and there are barriers to stop them doing that. Indeed. Can I talk, talking of, of similar th issues, actually, um, convicted rapists, we're told, uh, will be forced to serve their full sentence as part of what we're, we're told is going to be a gear change on dealing with crime to be unveiled by Rishi Sunak, uh, head of party conference or during party conference next week. Um, Look, I'm of the view that everyone should serve their full sentence. It seems like a mad idea to me that people sentenced to eight years, ten years, whatever, should serve that time behind bars and not half of it, sometimes in some cases, a, a third of it. Um, do you think there's any argument for this? Now, I think it's a sort of announcement, Julia, which absolutely creates cynicism amongst police officers. That's just an example of that, you know, that we know the prosecution rates for rape is less than 2%. So, you know, this is an absolute sideshow to the main issue that the vast, vast majority have no confidence whatsoever. The vast majority of women have no confidence in the criminal justice system dealing with offences against them, particularly rape. So, you know, this, I, but I think that's the sort of political announcement that creates cynicism uh, amongst the police and makes them feel that the government are not really doing with the fundamental issues uh, about particularly how the criminal justice system operates. Really good to talk to you. Great to get your uh, perspective. Sir Peter Fahey, former Chief Constable of Greater Manchester Police.